Okay, unpopular opinion coming in three, two, one. The impact of The Lighthouse has been undeniable. It has received high praise from critics and sparked many a conversation amongst art cinephiles about all the layers and subtext and stuff that lies within. But is it any good? Well, I think the answer is complicated. You see, art polarizes people. It gets them talking. It's open to interpretation. And it's often debated by critics far removed from the creator, sometimes with little clue as to what the artist's vision actually ever was. And that, I believe, is certainly the case with The Lighthouse. Now, no one's going to argue that it's not good art, because art itself can't really be measured like that. It's more about the way it communicates with us. And the X factor is the individual, who they are, and where they are at when they receive that communication. The Lighthouse communicates by abusing itself, the characters, and the audience. By getting drunk, shouting like a fuckwit on talk like a pirate day, masturbating, shouting again, and then falling into a heap of ejaculate, tears, and seagull shit. This is Robert Eggers' second feature film in the follow-up to 2015's The Witch, a supernatural period horror film that also polarised audiences and received high critical acclaim. Eggers co-wrote The Lighthouse with his brother Max, who had originally wanted to do a contemporary take on the Edgar Allan Poe story of the same name. That's not where it ended, though. The finished product looks nothing like Poe's story. Indeed, many people have likened it to something more like the work of H.P. Lovecraft. Set in the late 1800s, The Lighthouse tells the tale of two men assigned to tend a lighthouse off the coast of New England. Thomas Wake is a grisly old sea dog who's managed the place for years. Ephraim Winslow is the young man new to the job with a mysterious past. Now, regardless of the contract, which states the men share the work equally, Wake tends to the lamp and cooks the meals, and Winslow does pretty much everything else. Neither man is friendly, nor are they particularly likeable. Their contract is set for four weeks, however they find themselves on the receiving end of a few bad omens and worse weather, which leaves them stranded for much longer. This leads to a descent into madness resulting from isolation, hunger, too much booze and relentless work. The lines of reality and delusion become more blurred as the film goes on, and each man's idiosyncrasies start to grind the other down. That's what I mean! The cast is limited to Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe, and Dafoe delivers one of the most insane performances of his career as Thomas Wake. That's really saying a lot. He's had some pretty nutty roles in the past. But he really brings the language in this movie to life through some of the outrageous monologues. His coral tine trident screeches banshee-like in the tempest and plunges like through your gullet, bursting ye. A bulging platter no more. Robert Pattinson's Ephraim Winslow does more than keep up with him in the nutcase department too. Now during publicity for the film, Defoe commented on Pattinson's preparation for scenes as being a little wacky, with him doing things like inducing vomiting before scenes, beating himself up, and pissing in his pants. And look, I know there's a lot of calls for better representation in Hollywood, but mate, it's called acting. You don't have to be insane for real. It kind of sets the tone for what this movie is actually like. One of the big talking points around the film is the cinematography from Jaron Blaschke. How long have we been on this rock? Five weeks? Two days? Help me to recollect. It's not the movie you put on to show off your new top-of-the-line OLED 6K TV. It was shot on 35mm film in black and white with the old movie tone aspect ratio. Now, not content with replicating that effect digitally, they opted for movie making the hard way. And the final product is a really dark film, but with the kind of lighting they needed to use to achieve some of those visuals, it's a wonder the actors didn't go blind. How it looks, though, is a big part of its appeal, and it does set the tone for the entire story as does the sound from sound designer Damien Volpe. The ever-present foghorn, wind, seagulls, creaks, groans, drips and drops are all major elements that crescendo with the onset of the character's madness. This is given extra texture courtesy of Mark Corvin's dark and experimental score. Why just spill your beans? 
Eggers has said in interviews that he modelled the characters to represent Prometheus and Proteus. Proteus was the son of Poseidon, the keeper of knowledge, with a reluctance to share. Prometheus was a titan credited with creating humanity from clay, who defied the gods by stealing their fire and giving it to the humans. Zeus punished him by tying him to a rock and then having an eagle eat his liver, which would grow back overnight so the process could be repeated for all eternity. For those who didn't already guess, the fire of the gods in this movie is the coveted light atop the house. What's a timberman want with being a wiki? Just looking to earn a living. It's like any man. Starting new. On the run. The other subtext is of the queer kind. Two blokes alone for a really, really long time in a building that is basically a giant phallus with only one guy allowed near the goodness that lies at the end of it and the other just left to tickle the balls. When things start to get really nuts towards the climax, no one would be surprised if they ended up going all the way. Then there's this whole dominant submissive relationship that exists between the two of them. It's like Fifty Shades of Moby Dick with extra emphasis on the dick. Then there's the Lovecraft imagery, tentacles subtly dancing in the shadows or slithering away in the background, mermaids with their shark labias fueling Winslow's masturbation fantasies out in the foghorn shed where he literally beats himself stupid. It's all quite grotesque, neither character is likeable and the subject matter is really far from pleasant. The performance, language and cinematography are all very good, there's a lot to like about The Lighthouse from a technical standpoint. But there's not much to enjoy. Some people get off on being punished though, and for this kind of art, it's a shame that the audience has to suffer. Three out of five. Daddy! Let Neptune strike ye dead, Winslow! All right, have it your way. Hit subscribe, leave a like, tell me what you think, and for more straight shooting reviews, head on over to thewatchman.com.au.